going. Um, I've just got to operate PowerPoint here quickly. Uh, no, not that one. We'll get this right in a second. One thing I learned a long time ago, CTO means you are the guy that does the projectors in board meetings. So, my name's Joe Bagley. I'm the CTO for EMEA. Who here has never been to one of these keynotes at the UK VMUG before? Oh, good, interesting. The rest of you, there will be some revision today. Okay. <laughs> um, basically, uh, people ask me, well, can I have a all the time at VMware I get asked, can I have a copy of your current presentation? And I giggle because I send them it and they go, what are all these pictures? And you go, ha ha. Um, the point is that the presentation that I give you today um, is essentially the current point in time in my stream of consciousness of thinking, if that makes sense. And I spend my life trying to understand what the hell is going on. Some of you may have heard of Carl Sagan, famous astronomer, uh, big presenter in the US. I read something by him the other day that literally just sort of jumped out at me and said, hey, hell, that's me. He wrote that he was stupid. And the only reason he was good at explaining stuff to other people was that it took him so long and it was so difficult for him to work out what was going on that by the time he'd worked it out, he found a really good way of explaining it to other people. And I've realized that's me, basically. I'm quite stupid, but I'm good at explaining things to other people because it takes a long time for me to understand it myself. So this is kind of where it goes. So what I want to do is share with you a little bit about some of the last four years, and there's some recapping on some stuff. There's a large amount of I told you so, about 42 minutes in, which is kind of cool, okay? Well, for me, anyway. Um, but I want to start off with a, a quick slide. I'll just explain the T-shirt for Jane. Jane always gets excited about my T-shirt, okay? Um, I wear a different strange T-shirt every year, either with NSX on it. I think I had my out, I'm out of bed dressed, what more do you want T-shirt the other year. Uh, this one is because so far this morning I've already had three texts from my 12-year-old daughter asking what time I'm coming home and when can we download Battlefront for the Xbox. Um, so guess what I'm doing all night tonight and um, then persuading a 12-year-old that she can't go in sick, to, she can't bring in sick to school tomorrow if she has to actually go to school. Um, so this is an eye chart to begin with. It's always fun, but I'm going to explain it to you. I was at Gartner last week. Anyone here heard of Gartner? Oh, good. They come up a lot later. Um, so Gartner uh, have this thing called Symposium where they get together all the CIOs, which is a collection of people, old men in suits, and every year they get older and older. And what they did was they gathered together and they did some research and they asked their people a question, which is essentially, please list the top five IT and IT-related vendors and service providers, including hardware, software, outsourcing, and everything, in terms of the amount your business will spend with them this year and up to five other IT-related vendors and service providers that you consider important or strategic for your enterprise now or that will be in the next three years. And then for each of these vendors, indicate whether you view them as inhibitors, neutral, or accelerators for your business's digital needs today. So they put this slide up. Salesforce, Amazon Web Services, Google, and Apple are the top four. You can kind of guess that, right? Number five, VMware. Awesome, right? So yes, you've invested your career in pretty much the right place, unless you work for Apple and collect iPhones. Now, the interesting thing about that for me was at the Gartner Symposium Conference, those top four, Salesforce, Amazon, Google, and Apple, weren't at Gartner Symposium <laughs> because the CIOs of tomorrow aren't at Gartner Symposium. They're at different events learning about what's going on in the future. And we're having a conversation with Gartner along the same lines. So what I want to show you today is kind of explain to you some of the thinking that's going on in the heads of future CIOs, what's going on at the bleeding edge of technology in our world, and at the same time um, kind of explain to you where you should be thinking about going next. So a lot of these slides are revision, but that's because I told you it evolves. We are literally bridging two worlds, and we will be for quite a long time. We don't get to leave the old world behind. That client-server era, we spent a lot of time and money on, and a lot of effort on. We can't just throw it away quite quickly. And equally, this new super sexy mobile cloud era, we can't do it instantly. As they say, God only built the world in seven days because he didn't have any legacy systems. <laughs> and, and we have a challenge here that we have a lot. I don't call them legacy anymore. It's much more polite to call them heritage. People smile more. And you tell them they work on heritage systems. Oh, that's nice. Um, yeah. So you're going to have to work out how to join these two together. That's pretty much it. And so that's going to be kind of a theme of what I'm going to talk to you today, is how do you join these two together? What's on the other side of the bridge? And how do you start building bridges towards that? And there's a great slide. A lot of people in VMware are using this now. It's kind of showing you how we're going from 
We, we have it here as then and now, but for most of our customers, in fact, most of IT, it's actually now and the future is that we're going from a world now where it's kind of everything's known, assets are owned, you've got methodical planning, but the bottom piece here is the most important piece I want to highlight. It's that we're going from organizations that are built to last to organizations that are built for change. And there's a lot of throwaway lines said about that kind of change. Uh, Pat Gelsinger in his keynote this year said the, least, uh, the most, risk thing, most risky thing you can do in business is to not take any risks currently, today in business. If you stand still, you're going to get left behind. That's kind of a bit rhetoric-y, and everyone's always said that. But it is interesting, because you go into a lot more organizations today that want to be dynamic and interesting, and then they realize that they can't be dynamic and interesting. And so a lot of the conversations we have with them is how to make them dynamic and interesting. Um, I've got two daughters, right? They're 12 and 15. Crap names, but they're easy to remember. Um, now... 15-year-old lives in this world, and it's really made me think, because how many of you still have the same bank account that you had when you were 20 or 18 years old? Yeah, okay. My 15-year-old daughter is on her third bank account. Her third bank account, right? And she's not changing because they do better mortgage rates. She's changing because they have better apps. She changes banks because the app that she has is better, because to her, the bank is the app on her phone. It's not the building that you go to, right? And I only ever go to the bank to pay checks in nowadays when someone sends me a check, and you sort of get that check, and you're like, oh, crap. <laughs> you know, is it even worth my time? I'll just rip this up. Because <laughs> by the time I've walked there and paid it in, I've wasted this much money doing that, right? In America, they, believe it or not, America, the country that still doesn't have chip and pin, has some banks where you can take photos of checks and send them in, and that works. So you have to think about yourself that if you're a bank, you've got a whole generation now that associates you with apps, not with buildings and not with all the other kind of stuff. And if I've got a 15-year-old that's willing to switch bank accounts once every year, that's a whole different world if you're a bank. And you have to think about that for pretty much every business we're going into. And the app economy piece is about the fact that basically it is all about the app. Now, those of you who were here last year will remember me telling you that. It's not changed in a year. It still is all about the app. This slide still counts. This slide is still the conversation I have with customers every day. Every day. And what this slide is, is the cycle of enterprise IT. What you do is you deploy an application. That application generates some data you analyze the data, and you update or upgrade the application. That's what you do in IT. No one in IT went and said, I need a mainframe. The first banks did not go and say, do you know what we need to transform our business? A mainframe. They said, we need electronic banking. Just when IBM turned up and said, OK, where are you going to build this building? They go, what frickin' building? You go, well, we're going to put the mainframe. What mainframe? Oh, well, it's this thing that involves people with beards and, like, you know, they kind of poke it, and you put it in a building, and that's IT. And so what happened was we ended up with an entire industry that seemed to think that that building was what IT was about. Because they bought an app originally, but for some reason when ITM turned up and gave them a mainframe, they thought that was what IT was about. So we have built an entire career, an entire industry of people that stare at buildings. <coughs> or people that stare at infrastructure. When in fact, when you come back to it, it's not. It's about applications. So think about this cycle. Think about this cycle for you. Think about how long it goes through. I've covered this before, but very simply, in enterprise IT, we go around this cycle very slowly. It usually takes somewhere between three to five years before you go around the next cycle. When you go around that cycle is when someone tells you that you've got a new version coming. Typically, a vendor comes along and says, here's a new version of our SAP, or here's a new version of Exchange, or whatever it is, and you go through that cycle. We spent a lot of time and effort with um, developing things like ITIL and Six Sigma to make sure we go as slowly, slowly and painfully as possible around this cycle. Um, and basically, it's fine, because all the enterprises were equally crap. We're all going around equally slowly, so that's OK. And then some new guys come along, the sales forces, the Amazons, the Googles, etc., and they realized this cycle existed. We didn't. We were just doing it, right? We didn't know it existed. And so they realized this existed, and they realized that if you go fast around this cycle than the people next door, you win. And that's what they do. So all the stuff I've been banging on about, and you'll hear as buzzwords in our industry, all the cool development has come from them. In the 90s, if you wanted to go and find out what the next cool technology was, you went and you spoke to IBM. You spoke to HP. And you went and asked them, what are you going to release next year? What's on your roadmap? What's going to happen? 
That's not what we do today. What we do today is we all stare at the giants of the web and say, okay, what are they developing on the back end? But let me tell you something interesting. All that stuff, things like scale, big data, microservices, containers, designed for failure, all of that was them trying to work out how to go around this quicker than anyone else. They didn't develop Hadoop because they thought the world needed a better database. They developed Hadoop because they wanted to go around this cycle quicker. They did not develop things like Kubernetes and containers because they thought that would be cool, let's evolve IT. It was because it helps them go around this cycle quicker. It's not because they thought, what's the next amazing thing we can package up and sell to idiots? Right? It was because they said, what can help our business go quicker? And that's why they built this stuff. And so as Alaric said, um, last year I told you infrastructure's dead. Uh, it looks like one of our partners has finally worked that out, and they're coming up with the phrase invisible infrastructure or something like that, which is a phrase I think we were using at VMware probably four, five, six years ago, but never mind, they'll catch up eventually. Um, but in infrastructure is becoming invisible. It's not important anymore. What's important is how you go around this cycle. So today I'm going to talk to you a bit more detail about what's happening in our industry about this cycle hype and how infrastructure is changing to meet that. Because the question I get asked most when I show this slide to people, when I show this slide to CIOs, is what about infrastructure? Now again, to recap a little bit of revision, what are we building at VMware? Well, what we're building at VMware is the one thing that excited me to join the company in the first place nearly five years ago. Because when I came to look at VMware, it was like, oh, just a hypervisor, boring, not interested. And then I was persuaded and shown this vision and, and here we are. I also met a guy um, who, until last night, didn't realize, but um, it's in the audience. Alaric mentioned earlier, CTO Christos, who is uh, the CTO for the Storage and Availability BU, who's been very lucky to get over here. What he doesn't realize is he was actually my teaching assistant at Imperial College when I was a student. Um, I told him this last night and he still didn't believe me. Um, he still thinks he's younger than me. Um, but he said to me something last night that was kind of cool, is that now finally the stuff that he was working on back then is becoming useful. What was he working on back then? Distributed systems. When I looked at the, the people that were being hired and built into the office of the CTO, into R&D at VMware four and a half years ago, it wasn't the fact there were some cool people who knew some stuff about virtualization. It was that we were building a team of distributed systems experts. Because what we're building is a distributed system. So to explain that, I want to just very quickly go through why. Here's 1987. Back in 1987, we had a problem. We couldn't build one hard drive big enough or fast enough to meet the needs of the then rising relational databases on mini computers. Remember DEC? Now, what happened was we said, okay, we can't build one hard drive big enough fast enough, so what we're going to do is we're going to get together a collection of smaller drives, we're going to put them all together, and we're going to put a layer of hardware on top, and we're going to call it RAID. RAID stands for Redundant Array of Inexpensive Disks. The inexpensive bit is a lie if you're talking to EMC, but everything else is fine. <laughs> Now, <coughs> what you do is you then say, okay, fine, what I've now built with a RAID controller is cloud. You've just built cloud. It's just back then we didn't let marketing people with their crayons anywhere near the data center, so they didn't know. Um, so we couldn't call it cloud back then. But what you have was a system that was designed for failure. You could have elastic expansion. You add disks. The people at the top don't need to get told. If a disk fails, the people up top don't need to know. In fact, oh, look, it's designed for failure. How cool is that? Aren't you guys trendy, all you people that run SANS and NASs? You've been designing for failure for years. You just didn't realize it. Okay? But that's the point. We designed for failure in hardware. That hardware design for failure evolved to be done in software. So over time now, when you go and buy a SAN or a NAS, you go and buy a piece of uh, storage from any of these people, actually what you're looking at in most cases is some disks and an x86 processor and some software. There's not actually a lot of intelligent hardware anymore. We don't have those RAID controllers of back in the day that I used to rack up in those compact 4500 clients, right? They don't exist. You start put stuff up. It all happens in software. And that's kind of what's happening with um, vSAN and everything else now. So what I need you to do is take the leap of faith to understand what we're building at VMware is actually quite simple. Where it says RAID controller and where it says disks, swap the pictures. For disks, swap them for data centers. For RAID controllers, swap it for operating system for data centers, or as we're marketing people call it, the software-defined data center. We always called it the operating system for data center at the start because that expressed to engineers a bit better what it actually was we were building, and we still are building. So now when you look at things like virtualized networking, virtualized storage, we didn't go into virtualized networking just to piss off Cisco, right? That was a happy and interesting side effect. Um, <laughs> We didn't go into virtualized storage just to upset all the storage vendors. We went into these things because what we needed to do was to move storage and networking along with compute up to being done entirely in software. 
such that everything underneath became invisible and could be swapped in and out very, very easily. And the vision actually plays out. I mean, we call it hybrid cloud now, but we didn't really call it back then. We just called it an operating system for data centers. Because what it is is you can swap these data centers for clouds now. That's the idea. And when you look at some of the stuff we've done, like long distance vMotion in vSphere 6, we didn't do long distance vMotion in vSphere 6 because it was something cool to do and fun. And we thought that might be the, well, you said that we've done all this, what's next? Well, let's just do it really further. Okay, let's do it really further. We don't think like that. What it was was, we need to be able to move work workloads very easily between data centers, and we need that to be automated, and ultimately be done by an operating system with no human intervention. Hence, we need long distance vMotion. Hence, we need something like NSX, which smears across all your data centers and turns them into just one big, easy to move around free network area. Hence, something like metro clustering in vSAN, where you can start to actually go between data centers in a metro area, at least. And when we work on, Christos is working really hard on breaking the speed of light, we can then work out how to do it much further distances, but that's essentially what we're looking at there, is how do you get it to the point where where a workload sits is irrelevant, because it just sits on top of this operating system. And the operating system decides where stuff sits underneath that. That's what we're building. And also it means that you can get to the point where next time a data center fails, it's not a case of run around and find the latest copy of your CV. Instead, it's, oh, that's interesting. <coughs> Much as the same as a disk failure today, is that's interesting. So we talk a lot to customers now, and they have what we call Facebook envy. Or well, Ray calls it Facebook envy, I've called it Google envy or whatever. Um, and that's, in essence, that they look at someone like Google or Facebook and they say, well, these guys are running on, you know, commodity hardware, commodity storage, commodity networking, commodity everything, and they've got their own custom platform, and they can run any custom application. In fact, no, they don't. What they're doing is they built a custom platform specifically to support their very few applications. Unfortunately, you guys out there have an awful lot of heritage. We don't get a chance for you to just suddenly build your own custom platform. You can try. There's some lovely open source projects for you to try to build your, open pla your, own, your own custom platform. Good luck with that. Our job is to say, okay, well, how do we take you from the left there, where you've got a bunch of very, very closely integrated, very tightly integrated stacks, to over here, where you've got an entirely disintermediated stack that runs on top of what we call the software-defined data center platform that allows you to run any app on any x86, any storage, any network. That's what we're doing. This operating system for data centers is all in the context of enabling you to have one layer that smears across all that stuff. Now, that's really interesting. If you're an expert in racking and configuring RAID arrays. <coughs> Not a great future. Sorry about that. In fact, generally, if you look around and see that the job that you're doing is very similar to 10,000 other people in the industry, probably best to look at changing your skills, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But really, the vision that we have, and again, recap for you here, is that hopefully those of you who've seen the last scene of The Matrix, of the first film, not the next two, they're rubbish, the first one, Right? When Neo suddenly realizes that he can stop bullets and do this to Agent Smith and all that other kind of stuff, and he looks around and suddenly realizes everything around him is not physical, it's all code. That's the vision we have. Infrastructure as code for us is literally that, the fact that everything should just be easy to move around. It should just all be able to do it in code. You shouldn't have to go and file a ticket. The number of people I go to that say they've got infrastructure as a service, and you actually go and look at what they have got, and they've got tickets as a service. It's not really infrastructure as a service at all. It's, it's shocking and embarrassing. Now, the other thing to talk about is that if all this stuff is going to be commoditized hardware, what happens to the hardware vendors? Is it a world full of white boxes, as I've talked about before? Well, the answer is yes. Yes, it is going to be a world full of white boxes. But that's good news. It's just different news. And I want to explain the white box thing in a bit more detail today and drill down on that one for you. Because obviously, you know, we're owned by a hardware company today. We're probably going to be majority owned by a hardware company this time next year. So me standing up here and slagging off hardware companies, how does that work? Well, the hardware companies are changing and evolving. And you have to look back at history to see that. Now, you can look back um, in near history, you can look back in far history. Near history, you just have to look what virtualization did to, storage ven uh, to server vendors. Very simple. When we first started virtualizing servers, everyone went, well, Intel's going to be really upset with you because they're going to sell less chips. No, they were fine. They built specific chips with specific support for virtualization, which you all see today. 
Then they said, well, the hardware vendors are going to be upset with you, Dell, HP, et cetera, et cetera. They're all going to be upset because they're going to sell less servers. No, they changed what they shipped to be a slightly different server line, and now you'll see what you're shipping to your data centers is very different to what it was 10, 15 years ago. Still x86 inside, but it's a different goal. So when you're a networking or storage company, you can't go, oh, the end is nigh. You go, oh, the future is different. And the real clever people are working out how that future is different. And the basic rule of thumb is more volume, less margin. Less differentiation in hardware, more stuff goes to software, less margin, more volume. Now, let me tell you the more volume bit, because that's where the beards come in. Now, this guy is British and has a far more awesome beard than I have. And his name was William, who's dead, though, so I win. Um, <laughs> William Stanley Jevons, back in the 1800s. Those of you who follow the Cloud Arati and some of the people that talk a lot about cloud on Twitter will have heard us talk a lot about Jevons' paradox. I wanted to explain Jevons' paradox to you today. William Stanley Jevons, back in the 1800s, was an economist. And back then in the 1800s, we had a problem with the Industrial Revolution that we didn't have enough coal. We were literally shipping coal into the country. And so the challenge was, how do we actually solve that problem? And some people were going, well, what you do, of course, if you're using too much coal, is you make more efficient steam engines. And William Jevons went, nah, that's a really stupid idea. Why not? We'll use less coal. No, because if you make more efficient steam engines, what happens is the price of operating a steam engine drops. Therefore, more people find more ways to use steam engines. Therefore, you end up with more steam engines, which means they get more efficient. It's a virtuous cycle, and eventually you end up with millions of steam engines using way more coal than you ever used before. And they went, nah, that'll never happen. That's exactly what happened. And that's exactly what's happening in computing. The reason we talk about Jevons' paradox is everyone said, well, if everything's going to the cloud, we're going to use less computers, right? Hell no. When everything goes to the cloud, things get cheaper. People start doing things with computers they never thought they could do before, and they do it more often because it's cheaper to use compute. Stuff you'd never considered to do using a computer now becomes possible. Now becomes essentially free. So you start doing it. So now you end up with data centers that look like this. This is Google's data center, or one of Google's data centers. This is what the data centers of today look like. This is what people are building. Now, yes, we're building more data centers, but what people are putting in those data centers is a little bit different to what people put in the data centers of five years ago. Now, there's a lovely game I like to play with enterprise people now, is we look at this slide and we play Spot the Sam. No? OK. Let's make it easier for you. Spot the blade chassis. Nope, still not winning. OK. Uh, spot the 6509, no, uh, oh crap, what's this data center full of? Racked 1U and 2U servers. Evo Rail, anyone? That's the whole idea. The future of the data center is racked, commoditized hardware with everything done in software. It's that simple. The top of those racks you'll find are essentially where all the green and blue stuff's going is a bunch of 10 gig or 40 gig switches onto a backplane with everything that's being done on those switches done in software. So that's why Evo Rail. We didn't do Evo Rail because we decided we wanted to suddenly, you know, start selling hardware. <laughs> no, we're not in that game. Um, what we wanted to do was change the market define and supply the Lego building blocks for the data center of the future to make it easy for you to build one of these because most customers I talk to don't have the know-how or the understanding how to do that. And I'm going, oh, it's easy. I'll give you a standard definition of a hardware you can go and buy from eight or nine different hardware providers. You put the software on it, you rack it up, and suddenly, bingo, you've got that. You've got a software-defined data center. You've got an operating system for data centers. So hardware's are changing. Hardware's evolving. Hardware's changing. The hardware of five years' time, 10 years' time in your data center is going to be very different to the hardware that you're racking up today. Hopefully, it's starting to look like this. You can find out more about Evo Rail at some of the sessions today. But what happens with the software? Because as we all know, that the answer to every software and every computer science problem is to introduce another layer of abstraction. We did that originally with virtualization, and now we're introducing even more layers of abstraction. So what is going on in the software stack? Why isn't virtualization enough? Why are people talking about other things now? And how does that all fit together? Well, so if we go back again, NIST definition, 2007, 2008 of standard um, cloud computing, you had IaaS at the bottom, you had PaaS, then you had SaaS, 
and we're all happy, and that's going to be the future, and cloud's done now. Any questions? And then we all kind of plodded along at that. Didn't really get too scared. It's fine. We're building IaaS. We're building IaaS. We're building a private cloud. Don't worry about it. We're building a private cloud. Yeah, yeah, we're building a private cloud. And then up pops this. IaaS Plus. Well, I've called it IaaS Plus because I find that's the easiest way because that, to me, where it kind of fitted in the stack where it came up. And though use, those of you who might have heard of it might have heard it under a different name. You might have heard it called Docker. Who here hasn't heard of Docker? Oh, a few of you. Okay, right. You have now. Now, Docker popped up. Now, some of you remember I mentioned Docker in my keynote in 2013. Remember revision? Told you so? Yeah, fine. Here we are. Now, Docker is nothing new and nothing special. So why is it so big? And what is it? Docker is virtualization at the operating system level. It's GSX. It's actually not even GSX, because you don't run an OS inside each instance. It's terminal server. OK? It's, um, if you want to go back in time for some of you, it's uh, Solaris Zones, it's WPARs, it's um, BSD jails, it's all these other different things. Okay? It's getting the operating system and carving the operating system up into small pieces. So that's what Docker is. Why are we talking about Docker? I thought we'd done virtualization. Why are people doing that? Well, the answer is it's your fault. And I'm going to tell you why. Because Docker is essentially a shipping container for code. Those of you who remember way back will remember me having some slides about shipping containers and virtual machines being shipping containers, yes? VMware claims that one too, just no one remembers. So Docker is a shipping container for code. Developers love Docker because it makes it really easy for them to package stuff around and move it. it because it helps them to solve this problem, which is the problem in most organizations. Okay? <laughs> Now, those of you who can remember 2013 will remember I had some animals in my pictures. Okay? Yep, this one. Okay? That's my cat. I did have two cats at the time, but now I've got one. That's the one cat that's left, mainly because it stays indoors most of the time. Now, I talked to you a lot about kittens and chickens. I got complaints last year from many people that kittens and chickens weren't in my presentation, so I've brought them back, but I've brought them back so I can say, I told you so. This is I told you so, okay? Because way back when I told you what was happening was kittens was about the fact that in most of your data centers, most of the administrators know the names of every one of your servers, right? You also could point me to every one of your servers. If one of those servers is feeling sick, you spend hours, days, weeks sleeping in the data center next to it trying to get the thing well again. Okay? We all know what we're talking about here, right? Whereas the future of application architecture, microservices, scale out web, is where you don't have that, you have chickens as servers. No one knows the names of any of the servers. No one cares about the servers. In fact, if one of the servers is not very well, the last thing you do is try and fix it or take it to a vet. You take it around the back of the shed, have a very short conversation with it, <laughs> and, and then you go and get another chicken. That's microservices. That's containers. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Now, what happened was, I warned the industry, Randy Bias, who actually invented this meme, but he talks about it as pets and cattle, um, we've all been warning the industry for a long time about the fact that we have to change from hugging our kittens to not giving a crap about chickens and building for thousands, but we didn't. And so what happened was some developers came up to us probably about 2013, 2014, and Amazon screwed up too, it's not just you, okay, and said, hello, I'm developing a microservice architecture web application, at which point all the infrastructure and ops people went, mm -hmm. And they went, OK, let me explain this simpler to you. What I need is an API where I'm going to come and request about 1,000 instances an hour and build those up and break those down repeatedly. At which point, the ops people went, you what? You want to build 1,000 VMs an hour and then break them down again, then build another 1,000? Nah, you can't do that. And what's an API anyway? I don't know what they are. I can do you a really cool web portal. 
Um, you can click on that. My mum loves it. All right. Now, what the developers then did was they said, oh, okay, fine, so you're not going to do that for us. Okay, fine. I'll tell you what, I'm going to talk to you in your language, Mr. Develop Mr. Ops guy. Can you give me one really big server? Oh, yeah. Do them all the time. So they give you one really big VM. And they go, and you go, what are you going to use the one really big VM for? Nah, don't worry about it. Don't ask. You don't want to know what goes on in here. It's fine. So they take one really big VM, they install a thing called Linux, which has a thing called LXC, which allows them to carve that Linux up into thousands of tiny pieces and call on it with an API and spin up and down on the bits they need for their application. And as far as you see it, you see one big VM that's doing a load of weird stuff that you don't really understand, that's putting a load of weird I.O. on your network and, you, and on, your, on, your, on, your, um, on your disks that you really don't understand, but you can't shape or model. And um, you get upset with the developer. Docker! Okay, that's basically it. They couldn't get someone to treat them and deliver them chicken farms. They couldn't get someone to give them that, so they went out and they built their own. Because we failed. The infrastructure and ops guys failed to move fast enough for the developers. Now, you may say, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell my developers they can't do that. Well, sorry, they can, because the business sees the benefit. Right now, with microservice architectures, you're seeing with the way they're building these things, typically fewer failures, faster failure recovery times, shorter lead times, more frequent deployments, all this continuous integration, continuous deployment stuff, all that stuff around getting around that cycle quicker, apps data analysis, microservices makes it really, really easy and quick to get around that cycle. Because how does someone add a piece or feature to one of your applications today in an enterprise environment? It's a six, 12-month thing. In this environment, they're doing it multiple times a day. So of course, this is cool and trendy. Of course, people want to do Docker. Now, this is where it's all going to get really familiar for those of you who've been playing with virtualization for 15 years or more. OK? That is not me. <laughs> Christ. I send shivers down my spine, that. <laughs> um, so, that's completely thrown me. Microsoft finally have sabotaged one of my keynotes. Brilliant. <laughs> okay. So, what that's doing is essentially reminding you guys of stuff we've already done. Because if you go to the Docker conferences, and there was one this week, and we've got some guys here, Robbie Jerome, who's running a session a bit later on, has just come back from DockerCon in Barcelona. We had a real trouble persuading him to leave Barcelona and come to Birmingham. <laughs> he said it starts with the same letter. It's got to be about the same, right? Um, but interestingly there, you see the buzz. What's going on at Docker? Do you, know, do you know the most exciting thing they talked about this week? Someone showed that they'd hacked together a way to move a container whilst it was running from one place to another. And all of us are going, uh, yeah, uh, can we rewind you back a few years uh, to vMotion? Anyone heard of that? And besides, anyway, if you're building a container microservices chicken-based architecture, why on earth are you moving chickens? You should be killing a chicken and just getting another chicken in the new chicken coop. You don't actually, you don't need vMotion in the new world. So when you look at what's required in this new world, it's not just Docker, there's other ones you'll hear about, there's Rocket, or an RKT as it's now called, there's Garden, there's various other different guises of this containerization, this way of splitting up the operating system within a VM. Um, they're missing a whole bunch of stuff. And if you look at the stuff we want to put into this platform going forwards, it's all stuff that we've done. Security isolation, data persistence, resource guarantees, overcommit and rebalancing, management tool sets, all of this stuff exists already in the virtualization layer. So why are they rebuilding it? They don't need to, because guess what? We've already built an area where chickens and kittens can live together in harmony. <laughs> I knew it would come back, see, told you. My favorite slide of all time. My daughter, every time she sees this, wants this printed out and put on a wall. I'm not kidding, I'm telling you, no, it's not happening. Trust me, don't ever search for chicks and cats on the internet. <laughs> Now, how does the chickens and kittens living together work? Well, it works because of what we've done before. Some of it's deliberate, some of it's actually accidental, and I'll tell you some of that now. So, the first is what you'll hear is vSphere integrated containers. Now, before you get into sticking there and reading that slide, I'm going to switch back to this picture because it's nicer. 
What do developers actually want? Remember what I told you? They want an API where they can spin up instances really quickly. Now they want that API to talk to Docker, because Docker's come in and it's become the API that you used to do that to develop in. So what do developers want? They want a Docker API. What does, operating, what does Ops give them? Nothing, a VM. There you are. We'll give you the vCloud API. What's that? Ugh. Right? There we go. So what we did was we sat down and we thought, okay, how do we do this? So we did a bunch of testing, thinking, et cetera, et cetera. And now we have a way through a project called Project Bonneville to deliver a Docker API to the users. What happens underneath is really cool, okay? Because underneath, every time they go and say, I want a container, it fires up a VM. And that VM has that container inside it. And you go, Joe, yeah, whatever. You work for a virtualization company, so of course the answer is to put a container in a VM. Last thing I want to do is have thousands of VMs, each with an individual container in it. The whole point of containers is that you have big machines and you divide that. No, it isn't, actually. And I'll tell you why. First of all, one of the key features of Docker is the fact that, or LXC, is the fact that you can, this is really cool, right? What you can do is you can get a container and you can kind of freeze it. And then you can instantly create a thousand copies of that container in fractions of a second. Well, you're not really creating copies. What you're actually doing is you're creating a bunch of pointers that when someone then goes to use that instance, it then does copy on write and starts making the changes after that. Okay? It's kind of a lie, but it's cool. And it's one thing they like about containers is they can quickly go times a thousand, <laughs> done. Right? They think they've deployed a thousand containers. They haven't. I deployed one and some virtual pointers. Well, anyone heard of something called Instant Clone? Came out in vSphere 6? Been around since about 2010, 2011? Exactly that. You get a VM, you clone it, done. Fraction of a second, thousands of VMs. So, next thing. We were doing some testing of containers. And what we did was, and this is all available on a blog, I'll give you a link in a second. We got Redis, which is a scale-up workload. And we ran it native on bare metal. We ran it in Docker on <coughs> machine. We ran it in a VM. And then we ran it in Docker in a VM. And you'd expect that the VM would give it 1% or 2% overhead, right? That's typically what we were gunning for. And all this testing, we were going, OK, if I want to make sure that when you put stuff in here, it's about 1% or 2% overhead, that's acceptable. Guess what happened? If you put this stuff in Docker in a container, sorry, in Docker in a VM, it was 50% faster than if it was in Docker on bare metal. So get that, you add ESX and the thing speeds up by 50%. Of course, we went, yeah, right. No, we didn't, we went, holy what the, why is it doing that? Yeah, where have we gone wrong in our measurement? And then suddenly, not suddenly, it's a bit later, someone had this brainwave. They went, hang on a second, can we actually look at what Docker and LXC and all that stuff actually is? It's a Linux kernel, right? What are you doing? You're trying to get essentially a Linux kernel to optimize for resource sharing, overcommits, and oh, hang on a second, what's ESX again? It's a Linux kernel that we spent 15 years optimizing for resource sharing, overcommits, blah, 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 blah. What we realized is we'd done some specific work way back on NUMA optimization, non-uniform memory access, in our hypervisor that Redis loved, that meant that when you ran it in our hypervisor, in Docker as opposed to Docker natively, it ran faster. Also, don't forget that if you run each container in a VM, you can then use NSX to provide separation. You get management, you get visibility, you get all this other wonderful stuff. And now I've stolen pretty much all of Robbie Jerome's session, and he's giving me evils down the front here. Okay. But I really encourage you to go and listen to more on that, because that's essentially what we do. vSphere Integrator Containers allows you to provide an API northbound that is the Docker API, and underneath that allows you to spin up a, a VM for every single container, which means that from an ops perspective, you get much better insights. And the people using it actually see better performance in most cases. Chickens and kittens living together, same platform. Very cool. See? I knew the chickens and kittens things were relevant, didn't we, Jane? Told you. Right. Now, that's not cool enough for some of these people because they understand chicken architectures. Now, chicken architectures are... Exactly as I said, I don't need your SRM, I don't need your DRS, I don't need half that stuff you've got in the stack because I'm running a microservices, I don't care if a chicken dies, I just create a new one type of architecture. So when I do that, I need a different platform and I'm not going to go and pay all the money to you, VMware, for all of that stuff. So have you got something better? And we went, yeah, of course we have. 
That's Photon Platform. Photon Platform is a cut down version of ESX. It's ESX with all the unnecessary stuff removed. In that, you create just enough VM, and in that just enough VM is where you run your containers. And more importantly, it's got something called the Photon Controller, which is what we used to be called ESX Cloud, which is an open source. In fact, all of this is open source to allow you to then build that. So this is a lightweight, scalable, subscription-based platform designed specifically for running containers on and for building those cloud-native apps. So there's two answers here. You've got vSphere Integrated Containers, which is an extension to vSphere. It supports running any app. It's built for compatibility, and it has a perpetual license model. And on the right, you've got a new platform which is optimized for containers with large-scale API automation. It's got just what you need feature set, and you pay for it on a subscription basis. There's two answers there. And if you wanted to think, sit and think about it, you could almost go, well, hang on a second, VMware. Is this what you're building next? Yes, it is. I'll tell you right now, OK? That's what the future platforms are going to be built on, is that. And VIC is kind of what we're going to bridge to as we carry on. If you want something really interesting, I tweeted about it yesterday, Project Xenon. In fact, it was Tuesday, I think I tweeted. I've lost day, what day it is this week. Uh, have a look at Project Xenon. Project Xenon is a even more cool, amazing, future scale-out management plane. And for those of you who've complained that vCenter doesn't scale, I encourage you to have a look at Project Xenon, um, which has come out the office of the CTO, because that, again, will give you indications of how you do future management planes. Because one of the things I challenge our guys on in R&D is we write up on the board quite a lot, is how does this cope with a million? How does this cope with a billion? And that's something you should be asking yourselves in your architectures today. Because when I get developers in, in VMware come to me and say, I've got, a, I've got a great new way of managing X, Y, I go, well, how will that cope with managing a billion of those? How will that scale to do that? Log Insight was one of the first starts of that, and you'll see it more and more and more. The architectures are changing. We're in scale-out mode. And the reason I'm saying, how does that cope with a billion? Because I am now talking to customers about how to put and manage software in every car they sell. I'm talking to customers that have our software deployed and managed in every single Coke machine that you see to manage the Coke machine, and so on and so on and so forth. I've even got weird conversations I'm having with some people about how I, de how I deploy and manage a virtualized environment to every single home router in the world so that people can deploy stuff onto that for IoT. How does it cope with billions is core to what we're talking about at the moment at VMware in R&D. For those who want the link to the log, so the, to the blog, sorry, for performance, the Redis stuff, it's there, blogsvmware.com slash performance. It's the Vroom blog. And on there, you'll find information about the Redis stuff and other things. In fact, some of you may be quite interested in this. That's where we do all our performance testing releasing. So some interesting stuff on that blog. So a couple of things I want to sort of finish up on, because I'm conscious I've got sort of 15 minutes now because of where we started. Two things, really. Number one, how to build a cloud practice. Okay, how you build a cloud practice is not like this. You don't get your existing silo management teams and then hire a cloud team next to it. That's like hiring an officer of happy who has a team of happy people who stand in reception every day and hand out balloons to everyone and tell them they're all going to be happy today. Okay? That's the same as the cloud team going around telling everyone in infrastructure, we're cloud now. Any of you got any of those? Yeah. Not the way to do it. The way to do it instead is to actually change your culture, and that's the only way you're going to do it, is to focus on getting people around that cycle quicker, is to focus on delivering applications. So when you're thinking about how do I deal with this new world, how you deal with this new world is evolving your teams and evolving your hierarchy. If you think about how you're organized today, how would that organization work in a world where you've got one software layer that spans across multiple different bits of commoditized hardware? How will that work when networking, compute, and storage are all in one layer we call the operating system? How does that team look then? How does that team look then when you're focused on delivering an API, not supporting exchange? Because tell me, I'm not sorry, I'll tell you, that's exactly where we're headed. And so what you need to do is think about building on your existing IT investments by evolving to the software-defined data center. But more importantly, evolve your existing teams. Evolve your skills. Develop what you're doing. Change your processes. 
Transform IT to focus on delivering services around business outcomes, not around infrastructure. Stop staring at data centers. Start staring at the apps. Start staring at the users. Not in a really creepy way, though, because I found that quite upsetting for them. So to finish with, who here has heard of bimodal IT? Some of you, okay. You will do because most of the people in your management hierarchy have been to a conference in the last year with Gartner and all they've banged on about is bimodal IT and probably DevOps as well. Okay, so I'm going to explain it to you now. All this new sexy stuff I've just described, microservices, containers, scale out, all that wonderful stuff, chicken-based activity. Most IT organizations are not built for the chicken farming world, okay? They're built for the old enterprise world. They have procedures and policies, et cetera, et cetera. So when those CIOs went to Gartner and said, we'd really like to do that new agile stuff, because that agile stuff sounds really cool and trendy, and I've seen these guys in London, and like they've got beards and really tight jeans and fixy bikes, and I want to be like them. They go, well, you're not going to do it with your existing infrastructure and your existing people, and the way you've built it is so bad, you're never going to evolve that existing infrastructure and these people. So what you need to do is call that mode one, right? And instead, we're going to invent a new mode called mode two. And so you're going to literally operate in two different speeds, right? Mode one and mode two. And over mode two, I like to think they're more like this, okay? Agile people are cool, right? They're sexy. They're like the pioneers, the cowboys of the world. Um, they're attractive to both women and men, depending on the film. They allow you to <laughs> basically go out and explore new territories, kill things without rules, invent new ways of doing business, find new land. Okay, so think about discovering the Wild West. And here I'm borrowing from my friend Simon Wardley. So you think about discovering the Wild West. These guys are the pioneers. This is your agile team. These are your, this is your digital division. These are the guys building the mobile apps. These are the guys building the mobile apps for the banks. They're really cool. They're sexy. They're trendy. They're amazing. Aren't they lovely? Don't you want to be them? Well, that's a bit difficult because most IT and enterprises looks like this. These guys are out there in the Wild West literally beating down trees and killing people and capturing new land, whereas traditional IT is full of what we call town planners. It's full of policemen, mayors firemen, all those kind of people, procedural people, documentation-based people, fill out forms in triplicate kind of people. So now do you see why people talked about bimodal? Because when you've got these guys, these guys don't fill in forms. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> they don't use help desk systems. They don't log tickets. They just want you to give them some stuff and let them go wild. That's agile. That's your cowboys. These guys, on the other hand, they only work on forms. It's like the Vogons of IT, okay? Now, there, therein lies a problem. Because if you've got people like Gartner going out there telling you that bimodal is the future, can you see a car crash coming anytime soon? That's exactly the problem. You've got these people out here doing super sexy, woo, look at me, and you've got people over here going, what the, and oh, I can't do that. And the crunch is going to come in about two years' time. That crunch is going to come because these guys here are going to get bored with their mobile app. They're going to want to do the next thing after that. And what they're going to do is they're going to take their mobile app and they're going to want to turn around and give it to someone else to look after. And these guys are going to go, what the holy crap is that? I've got no idea how to even run that. I don't even know what it is. Do you have a risk assessment form for that? Is it PCI compliant? <laughs> and these guys are going to go, I don't care. <laughs> Move on, right? Future technical debt, big gap, nightmare. What you need is not bimodal IT. Of the minimum, it's trimodal. It's probably loads more than that. Because in the middle, there's these really cool people, which is you. OK? I'm telling you. If you want to be really cool, that's interesting and fun. But actually, the cool people wear dresses. I was going to come on dressed like that, actually, just to make a point, but never mind. These are settlers. These are guys that are absolute experts in taking novel, sexy, new, amazing stuff, i.e. new ground, 
and turning it into stuff that town planners can deal with. These guys build the first bank. They build the first hairdresser. They build the first saloon. In fact, they probably start with building the, the, the alcohol-based thing and then work from there, right? That's what these guys do. That's what's missing in this bimodal model. That's what the industry is going to be made of, and that's what the leaders of tomorrow are going to be. The leaders of tomorrow are going to recognize that when you look at the map, and this is, you get a bit.ly slash trimodal, much more information on this from Simon. But this is where you people realize there's, you go from over here, the sort of genesis, the cool, sexy way, through settlers to town planners. Now, the way to explain that is done in more detail on Simon's blog here, but you're never going to be able to read that from where you are, so I'm going to go back to here and explain it for you. Over here is for the slides. You'll get the slides later. Pioneers. Pioneers are the people that are most likely to make a kind of just about working 3D printer out of Lego. Okay, held together with rubber bands with like pens in it and stuff, right? Like felt tips they've nicked from their kids. That's your pioneer stuff. Settlers are the people who are most likely to steal one of these from the pioneers. Seriously, it's a system of theft. It's how it works, right? And productize it. These are the guys that do market research. They're the guys that go and talk to customers. They're the guys that understand how to make things into production. These are the guys that will ultimately turn, be able to turn around to the town planners with a fully formed 3D printer with instructions on how to build it, process it, et cetera, et cetera. And the town planners, what do the town planners do? Well, you think I'm going to say build 3D printers next, and that's true. But what's really cool here is that the town planners are also the people that made the Lego bricks in the first place. Where on earth do you think the pioneers got the Lego from? Where do you think the cowboys got their spades and their guns from? They got it from the industrialized West. So it is not about leaving these guys behind as heritage. It's not about just letting guys be sexy at the sun. It's about a whole evolutionary game. And when you crack, it's a cycle. That's when IT starts to get interesting. That's when you can start to find where your place in IT is and where you think you're going to help your organizations move forward. Because when you realize that you can be the guys that are either helping support and build that new application and then turning it round, if you want to put it onto types of technology, you know, functional models, over, oh, over here, this is Agile, this is your Lean, and this is your Six Sigma, for the real process people of you that like reading books, okay? That's where they fit in. So the future of IT is going to be built on this cycle. Netflix. You will hear Netflix used time and time again. You will notice that so far I've managed to give a presentation about the future of IT without mentioning Netflix or Blockbuster or Uber. Oh, crap, I've done it now. Okay. But the whole point about that is Netflix was built on Amazon. Amazon is the most town planner type environment you've ever been to. They are managing margin down to an inch of their lives. They're highly operational. They're incredibly Six Sigma. If you want to launch a product at Amazon in AWS, you have to write the press release first. And I'm not kidding. Go look it up. They have to have a solid foundation to build the agile future on. So go back and remind your digital teams. Tell them that if they want to be cowboys, they want to be those pioneers, they want to go and do that kind of stuff, they cannot do it without a solid base, a solid industrialized world to support them, and without a supply chain that's going to be there ready for them to catch them when they fall, and to ready to take their products and make them into something great, because their activity typically doesn't scale. And so really that's what you're here for. We're building this continuous platform that supports the kittens and the chickens. You're taking that and you're making people understand there's an evolutionary process. And it's not a case of today, it's Docker, and it's always going to be Docker. I promise you, application development and deployment techniques evolve. In three years' time, it's going to be something completely different. It's going to be something even weirder. I'll tell you what that is in a second, OK? But you need to be ready for that, too. And you can only be ready for that, too, by building a solid base. So that leaves me with a very simple set of questions for you. What next? Well, what's next after Docker is unikernels, but you'd have to come back next year to find out what they are. OK? Um, literally, I'll talk about I did mention them last year, actually. Some of you may remember I mentioned unikernels. And strangely, it was the coolest thing to talk about in Barcelona yesterday. Been there, OK? Unikernels is what comes next. Look it up. It's fun. It's basically executables. 
Well, as I was talking about this, Robbie, we're thinking what next someone's going to talk about, well, we're going to have a unikernel, and then we're going to have like these centralized shared libraries. We're going to call them DLLs. Okay, but anyway, a whole different story, right? <laughs> unikernels is next. What's next for you is kind of what I think I asked you last year. Think about the white box world. Think about how the world is going to evolve. When you're walking around through these sessions, when you're downstairs, think about how um, your world is going to change and evolve as you build different systems. Think about how you're going to help your company navigate putting the right things in the right places. Because not everything's going to go to one place. You're going to have hybrid apps. You're going to have in infrastructures and application architectures that are made out of bits and pieces from every piece of this. There'll be a solution that you'll push out that'll have a bit of SaaS, a bit of PaaS, and a bit of IaaS in it. It's all going to be a blended mix. How are you going to architect for that? And don't forget, same as last year, focus on going around this cycle quicker, because that's what's going to make the difference. That's what's going to make the difference for your business. That's going to make the difference for your customers. That's what's going to make the difference for you. That's how you prove to other people that you can go around this cycle quicker than anyone else. Microservices, containers, all that stuff came from people going to go around this circle quicker than you are. Make sure you keep up. And with that, I just encourage you to attend and really make the most out of today. Go to every session you can. And um, we've brought the brightest and greatest brains from VMware here today and Lee Dilworth to help give presentations <laughs> to you um, on what we're doing next. But also, what's very important to us is our partner ecosystem. So please attend some of the partner sessions as well. As someone who used to work for a partner, there's some people there doing some amazing things. And sometimes you're seeing a little glimpse of the future by going and looking at what they're doing too. So with that, please enjoy the day and have great fun. Thank you. A great session there from Joe. Thanks very much. Um, Joe's slides. Uh,